You know, I think the, the first thing you have to look at is the fact that we really kind of have had a, a structural change going on in organizations, all right? There was kind of an operational aspect of an endpoint management, and there was really a security aspect. Um, those forces are being, you know, kind of forced to converge, all right, to get a better end result. Um, you know, Gardner's saying that. Gardner is redefining the feature set that is, um, needs to be part of uh, an endpoint management and security suite. So we're seeing things like uh, patch management and vulnerability management were typically more operational in nature. You know, configuration management, those were operations functions. And then we saw, like, you know, personal firewall. We saw antivirus being the responsibility of security. Those things ultimately have to converge, all right? One, Compliance is kind of requiring that. I need to do all of these things. Why do I want to have two separate groups, each with their, you know, trying to touch that endpoint? Those distributed environments, that's a big challenge. So efficiencies are a big theme today, and those things need to come together to get a better compliance posture, a better security posture, and a better IT efficiency posture. So I think that's going to be a real driving force of how these things come together. The other thing you have to realize is that the key technology to endpoint security has been antivirus. All right, Gardner is saying that testing all the antivirus products out there, they're only 60% effective. That $5 billion industry cannot continue to survive and only provide 60% effectiveness, all right? So there has to be a change there. And really looking at all of the candidates of the technology that could be our best threat defense, all right, is really application whitelisting. And there's a lot of synergies between that the operational side of the house and application whitelisting, i.e., what versions of the software should be running on that endpoint. That's traditionally an operational task. All right? So getting those things in line with that new key technology whitelisting, a lot more of that responsibility is going to you know, fall on the operational side to make that successful. You know, I think it is a little bit. There's a couple of drivers that are going on there that people in the past and even security companies were very threat-centric. They talked about here's all the different bad things in the world and how can I identify them. And that identification is basically a filtering system. And whether that identification is at uh, the endpoint in an AV signature file or it's in some kind of... Um, um, you know, firewall type device or a unified threat management device or a um, uh, detrusion detection device. That's all very threat centric. Here are the types of things that I should be looking at. If, if you look at the endpoints though and if AV is failing to get the job done, what's going to replace it? Application whitelisting looks like that's going to be the technology that is going to provide the, the, the greatest benefit. And really, that's a very different approach, all right? That's not focused on threats. That's focused on what do I know to be good? You know, that's a much better position for businesses to be, over, to be in. They can control what they allow to run on their endpoints, all right? That's a very different model. That's a much more what do I trust? That's a trust-centric model versus a threat-centric model, all right? It's a lot easier for me to, to control the things I know about and allow those to run than it is to create filters to look for all the bad things. That model just isn't working. So I think that's a, that's a big shift. There'll, there'll always be a certain aspect of threat-centric. You have to react to those threats. And yet this new trust-centric view where what am I allowing to run in my environment has to create, uh, you know, find its place into more of the enterprise lexicon in a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So I think that's a, you know, this, this isn't replacing threat-centric, but it's definitely being additive, and there's a new view which is really trust-centric. What do I know about my environment? What am I going to allow, you know, to run in my environment? All right. Also helps out a lot, the trust-centric view is much more posture-based. And if we talk about compliance, another big driver in the industry, compliance is all about what's your defensive posture, what controls are in place, all right? That's much more of a trust-centric kind of view of things as well. Well, I think the, the, the tr trust-centric approach is really talking about application whitelisting, all right? So what are the changes of application whitelisting you're going to have on the environment? Really, it's about bringing some discipline to change control. And our first, you know, kind of the first iteration of application whitelisting, the security model was, was proven very, very powerful, a little inflexible. Where it was successful was where there was a tight change control process in place, all right? And frankly, a limited amount of change. So how do we get those security benefits 
and yet really make them more dynamic. And the way to do that is to take this trust-centric approach or introduce trusted change. So what do we mean by trusted change? We really want to set up a rules-based approach to change management. As opposed to it just being a written policy that we kind of hope everybody follows, we're going to set up rules and say, these are all the services, these are all the methodologies that change is introduced into the environment. And as long as they follow one of these paths, all right, we will accept that change and dynamically add all of the new content that that change introduced to the whitelist. All right, so that's a very different, you know, different approach. It really kind of, um, you know, gave us a new way to look at the market or to, to look at the problem. It was how do we make whitelisting more dynamic, and it was it was really the answer. How do we get a better handle on change control? So I think that's one of the, the fundamental things that, you, that is going to allow this technology to be more successful and more widely adopted. All right, and that's another benefit of really kind of the, the trusted change methodology. The goal was really to say, hey, how does change get introduced into your environment today, all right, and how do we set up a rules-based approach so that you don't have to change anything? That would really be ideal for people. They go, well, I know change gets introduced into my environment via these four ways. Can I not change that business process and accommodate this new security technology? That was really the challenge, all right, and we think we've done that by really setting up a, a, a rules engine that can accommodate multiple types of change from multiple different um, services. Um, you can trust publishers. You could trust users. We really tried to look at all the way change is introduced and come up with a rules-based approach to support that methodology. So in summary, if we look at really the, the key technology application whitelisting and what, what benefits it's going to offer organizations is it's going to provide a much higher return on investment than really AV is. If it's only, you know, if antivirus is only 60% effective as Gardner states, all right, application whitelisting without a doubt will provide a uh, much more secure platform. It will be much more effective against zero day vulnerabilities, all right. We really proved that in our first generation, you know, kind of technologies that application whitelisting is very secure. The challenge that we really had to overcome in the second generation technology was taking that security value proposition and removing the cost or the hurdle. All right, and the, and the cost and the hurdle was managing the whitelist. So how do we make this technology more flexible, more dynamic? We get all the security benefits from it. All right, and yet we wanted to make it more flexible and dynamic so that we could use in more dynamic environments like desktops. All right, and really the way to, to do that was to embrace this rules-based approach to change control. All right, that really would allow us to uh, support all of the methodologies that change is currently introduced into the environment, all right, and not give up any of those security benefits. So trusted change and a rules-based approach is definitely the right way to go about in reintroducing this whitelisting technology to the marketplace.